welcome. Would you please stand for our call to worship this morning? What a joy it is to gather together and worship our Lord. Would you hear this from Ephesians chapter 1? In him we have redemption through the blood, the forgiveness of our trespasses according to the riches of his grace, which he lavished upon us in all wisdom and insight. This is the word of the Lord. Would you please join us as we sing Cornerstone this morning?
heart grows cold. You may be seen. Welcome to LBC. We're glad to gather this morning together as God's people, and what a privilege that is. Uh, so welcome uh, on behalf of the pastors, the elders, uh, all those serving this morning. We are glad that you're here to worship the risen Lord Jesus. Uh, here at LBC, we like to say that we're transformed by the gospel. The gospel is God's good news, that he saves sinners like you and me through the death, resurrection, life, death, and resurrection of Jesus. It's good news that though we were once alienated from the life of God without hope and without him in this world, through a relationship with Jesus Christ, we have true hope both now and forever. And because of that good news, we gather together on a weekly basis. Um, one of the things that I was thinking about this morning uh, is why we gather. You know, gathering and getting to church on a Sunday morning is hard work. Uh, there's lots of things that compete for our time and attention. And I don't know if you've ever had this experience, but sometimes uh, it's just like dragging your feet to get here. Maybe your children are literally dragging their feet, or maybe emotionally you're just dragging getting here, and you don't know how you got here this morning, but you're here. And that happens to me sometimes, even as a pastor. But what I often find is that when church is church, when it's what God has made it to be, that even if we're dragging on the way in, hopefully, we are, spiritually speaking, skipping on the way out. Because here's what Scripture tells us about the point of gathering. Hebrews chapter 10 says that we're to not neglect gathering together as some are in the habit of doing, but encouraging one another, 
and all the more as you see the day approaching. You know what's interesting about that to me is that it doesn't say instead of not gathering, we should gather. It says instead of not gathering, we should encourage one another. What that tells me is that at least in part, the purpose of gathering together, obviously number one is to glorify and make much of God. But there is a human part of our gathering together that ought to function to encourage us because life is hard. And the Christian life following Jesus in this world is difficult, and we need encouragement. And so my prayer is that as a church, as we seek to walk worthy, keeping in step with the Spirit, living out the life of God together, that we can encourage one another in our gatherings together. Here's one thing I'm encouraged about this morning, uh, and that is that this week, starting up on Thursday night, uh, we will begin LBC Thursdays again, uh, and the Awana ministry for our children will kick off. And one of the reasons that's encouraging to me is because we had a a shortage. There was a number of factors. Uh, We didn't have enough workers to be able to host that ministry uh, this fall, and a couple of uh, people have stepped up to say, we want to serve kids and help teach them the good news about Jesus. And so we're back on this Thursday. And so uh, we'd love to see you back out on Thursday night. Pastor Dennis will continue teaching his class through the book of Colossians, and it's a great time just to be together in the midweek on Thursday night. So I'm encouraged to be able to share that good news with you. But one of the other things that we do together, uh, one of the ways in which we encourage one another is actually by moving toward one another as God has moved towards us in Christ. Romans 15, 7 says that we are to welcome one another as Christ has welcomed us for the glory of God. And so I want to invite you this morning just to stand and to welcome your neighbor in the name of Jesus as God has welcomed us through Christ. Would you, would you uh, pray with me now as we prepare our hearts to continue in worship? When asked by a scribe what the most important rule of the scriptures was, Jesus answered this way. The most important is this. Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind, and with all your strength. The second is like it. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. There is no command greater than these. Would you pray with me? Father, this morning we worship you. We recognize that in your word we see lots of commands, but every one of your commands is good and right. It is a perfect reflection of your character. In your rules we see who you are in all of your righteousness. This morning we worship you. Father, we confess that sometimes we look at those rules, some of the commands in the scriptures, and we resent those. We feel like those restrict our freedoms and we kick against those. We want to do life on our own. We don't functionally love you as we ought, nor do we love our neighbor as ourselves. And for that, we're truly sorry. We come this morning in a spirit of confession, recognizing that we have not been or thought or acted as you would have for us. And so we have restricted our freedom and we have made ourselves slaves to sin. Would you forgive us? Father, we thank you that you have made every provision for us in Christ, that we can be justified freely by your grace through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus as a gift that comes by faith. We thank you for that good news that's offered to each of us who would repent and put our trust in Christ, and we need that fresh this morning. Father, this morning as we continue to sing, would you make our hearts glad in your presence? Would you stir up our affections, longings, and loves for Jesus? We confess that we love the things of the world more than we ought, and we need to have our hearts reoriented and recentered on what is truly good, right, and beautiful. This morning, Father, we come also just lifting up our requests to you. We know that there are many burdens faced by this congregation, some of which are health burdens, and so this morning we lift up those who are just suffering 
with bad news uh, of cancer, with bad news of other Ill illnesses and diseases that just weigh heavily on the mind or awaiting test results. Lord, we pray for persevering faith among our brothers and sisters who are struggling with health. We continue to lift up Little Piper, Lord, as she continues to go through treatments as well, asking that you would bring a complete healing to her body. And we pray for perseverance for the family. We pray, Lord, also for those students who are going back to school and have started fresh again, and for all of the educators among us who continue to teach. We ask that you would just give them uh, a season of perseverance and, and refreshment, Lord, and a desire to learn, to teach, Lord, in a way that is, is helpful, Lord. And we thank you for the privilege of education, but often in these winter months, it can be hard to remain focused, grounded, and centered. And so we pray for all of the students and teachers among us. Father, we also pray this morning uh, for those who are just struggling in faith, doubting your goodness, questioning your character, and just wondering if you're really real. And we ask that for those who are struggling in faith, you would just make yourself known to them in a real way, not just generally in their life, but in particular this morning. So as we worship, as we hear your word, would you minister to us? We lift up our hearts, our eyes, our minds, and attentions to you this morning. We pray this in the name of Christ, our Savior. Amen. As we continue to sing, would you stand with us? Praise the 
victory over the grave. They're in the ground. They're in the ground. His body Mine. 
please be seated. morning. My name is Chris. I'm one of the pastors here. I've been coming to LBC events since I was five years old. Uh, I consider myself triple blessed uh, to be part of three families. Uh, we were down in Virginia visiting my wife's family and so thankful for uh, uh, people who care and love us uh, from a different state and that we can go visit. Uh, I have my biological family um, that, that I'm thankful for and this church family that I've been a part of. And if you want to upgrade your life in one easy step, I would submit this to you for this year. Get here on Sunday morning, every Sunday. I, I truly believe that your life will go better uh, if you're just here. Because sometimes we overcomplicate spiritual growth, but gathering together as the people of God is the central foundational practice of the Christian life. Just get here. Even if everything else goes awry with all your resolutions, with all of your commitments, just get here on Sunday morning. And I don't think it will go better in the fact of that um, you're going to double your income and, and get a lot thinner. Um, the precise opposite, actually. I think it's that when your life falls apart, being here consistently gives you what you really need. Singing, sermons, sacraments, we experience God, which is what we need when our life falls apart through singing together. I mean, y'all believe some stuff, right? That was awesome. One of the greatest encouragements for me as a pastor is to look around and see you singing, because I know that you believe those words. Um, you need to hear God's word preached, and we need to participate in the sacraments of the Lord's Supper and, and baptism. That's where we meet God, and we need each other, too. There's some really bad advice out there in the world if it doesn't come from a Christian perspective, and that's why we gather together, too, to encourage each other, and I think it's precisely when our life is going terrible that we need church even more, and I think it does make a difference. So that's my my slight plea to you, but make it a commitment, make it a habit, make it a blackout time. Sunday mornings, I'm here, and, you know, obviously we understand extenuating circumstances, vacations, just on one, sickness, homeboundness, and whatnot, um, but the general tenor, right? Let's make it a point to gather and commit as the people of God, and we come together to hear the word of the Lord. Our reading is from Exodus chapter 20. Uh, we are starting a new series in the Ten Commandments. Does anyone know the Ten Commandments in order? You think you know them, all ten in order? This is a topic that I think we may vaguely have some idea of, like, aren't they, like, on a court building somewhere? But these are part of God's Word. So we're going to study them, learn from them. And so hear this from Exodus 20, our scripture reading. This is the Word of the Lord. Then God spoke all these words, saying, I am the Lord your God who brought you out of the land of Egypt, out of the house of slavery. You shall have no other gods before me. You shall not make for yourself an idol or carved image or any likeness of what is in heaven or above, on the earth beneath or in the water under the earth. You shall not worship them or serve them, for I, the Lord your God, am a jealous God, visiting the iniquity of the fathers on the children on the third and the fourth generations of those who hate me, but showing loving kindness to thousands, to those who love me and keep my commandments. You shall not take the name of the Lord your God in vain, for the Lord will not leave him unpunished who takes his name in vain. Remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy. Six days you shall labor and do all your work, but the seventh day is a Sabbath to the Lord your God. In it you shall not do any work, you, your son, your daughter, your male or female servant, or your cattle, or your sojourner who stays with you. For in six days the Lord made the heavens and the earth and the sea and all that is in them and rested on the seventh day. Therefore the Lord blessed the Sabbath day and made it holy. Honor your father and mother, 
that your days may be prolonged in the land which the Lord your God gives you. You shall not murder, you shall not commit adultery, you shall not steal, you shall not bear false witness against your neighbor. You shall not covet your neighbor's house, you shall not covet your neighbor's wife or his male servant or his female servant or his ox or his donkey or anything that belongs to his neighbor. All the people perceived the thunder and lightning flashes and the sound of the trumpet and the mountain was smoking. And when the people saw it, they trembled and stood at a distance. Then they said to Moses, speak to us yourself and we will listen, but let not God speak to us or we will die. Moses said to the people, don't be afraid, for God has come in order to test you, in order that the fear of him may remain with you so that you may not sin. So the people stood at a distance while Moses approached the thick cloud where God was. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, as we look into your word, may you teach us, may you instruct us, make you reform and reshape our thinking, our feelings, and our behavior. I pray, Lord, that you would show us Christ through your word. Every word of the Bible is about Jesus. And so let us see him more clearly through these words this morning. In Jesus' name, amen. So we're through Christmas time, and uh, those of you who have young kids probably, and I mean like newborns, and, and around that age probably saw the cliche happen that they don't care about the gift, they just want the box and the paper. And uh, it's a little frustrating as a parent. You're like, you see all the awesome toys, it makes all the sounds and the lights and everything, and they don't care about that at all. They just want to rip stuff apart. The paper and the box, they don't understand, right, in their, in their newborn brain, they don't understand the box is just a vehicle for the gift, that's all it is. It's just a vehicle for the gift. They don't know that the box is not the gift itself, but they're young, so they'll get over that. But they don't know what the purpose of it is, right? It's just merely a vehicle to get us uh, the gift. But when we get older, uh, we can misunderstand the purpose of things too, and it hurts a lot more. Uh, like if you get back into the gym in the new year and you misuse the equipment, like sometimes you see people doing things in the gym and you're like, that just looks painful. They don't know what it's for and they can hurt themselves. But even other things like our place in relationships has a purpose. There's a purpose to it. And if we don't understand that, we can really make a mess of things in our lives. You know, if we don't understand really that our purpose is to love and serve others, but instead we make life all about ourselves, we damage the relationships around us. If we don't understand the purpose of, of work, for example, right, we may tie our identity too close to work and think that we gain our value by what we're doing and we feel anxiety and pressure, undue pressure in our jobs. Or maybe we don't see the, the good purpose of work and so we're just lazy and we don't commit ourselves to doing what God would have for us. We need to know the purpose of things in order to truly live a, a flourishing life. And the same is true in our spirituality, especially when we come to the commands of God, the Ten Commandments, because these things uh, are often very easily misunderstood. There's myths that kind of come up, whether it's through popular culture or whether it's through family heritage. There's certain kind of myths that that kind of come to us about the Ten Commandments, about God's law, about the commandments of God that we can, can believe, but if we misunderstand what the Ten, Command, Ten Commandments are really about, we'll make a mess of, uh, of our spiritual lives. And that actually has long-term ramifications. So this sermon today is going to be a little different. Um, it's kind of setting the series, framing the series for what we're doing as we get into the Ten Commandments. I'm not actually going to look uh, at any uh, one of the Ten Commandments this morning, but I'm going to set a framework for us, okay? So we're going to look at three myths, three myths about the Ten Commandments this morning. So if you're taking notes, three myths about the Ten Commandments. Here's myth number one. Myth number one. The Ten Commandments are a way of salvation. The Ten Commandments are a way of salvation. I think that this is probably one of the myths that, that comes up most frequently inside uh, the church. 
it usually originates amongst us in that we think that our obedience and our moral performance will earn us favor before God. And oftentimes what happens is Christianity gets twisted and misinterpreted instead of the story of God and how he has come to save us, we reform and reshape Christianity into about being a, a code of moral conduct. That's not really what it's about. That's not what the gospel and the good news of Jesus is about. It's not actually about being a good person. It's not about earning God's favor. We see that the Ten Commandments were never intended, never intended to be a source of salvation. And to, to see this, we need to be close and attentive readers of the Bible. And so if you're looking at the text this morning, look at the first two verses. These are, these are key because the Ten Commandments don't come to us with a thou shalt not right away. They don't start that way. How, how do they start? What is the context? We've got to pay attention to these things so we're not misinterpreting the Bible. It says here in verse 1, Then God spoke all these words, saying, I am the Lord your God, who brought you out of the land of Egypt, out of the house of slavery. So the Ten Commandments start with God revealing who He is, a revelation of Himself. So often, though, we want to jump to the do's and don'ts. If I just do the do's and don't the don'ts, I'm going to be good. God is going to be happy with me. He'll make my life go better. I can earn favor with Him through my moral performance. If I'm a good person, God will like me. Things will go okay. That's the typical way we approach it. That's not how they start. It starts with God. I am the Lord your God who brought you out of the land of Egypt, out of the house of slavery. Do you see God's grace oozing through these first two verses? It's pouring out of them because God is saying, I brought you out from Egypt. I am the one who liberated you from slavery. That's his grace. The people didn't free themselves. The people didn't redeem themselves. The people didn't rescue themselves. It wasn't about their moral performance. It was about God and his performance. And his work. Relationship. He says, I am the Lord your God. See the word Lord there? It's in all caps, like mini caps. It looks kind of strange. That is translating the word Yahweh, which is God's covenant name, his family name, so to speak. He's saying, I'm your father. You're my children. I love you. I am the Lord, your God. Relationship precedes rules. It comes before the rules. God is saying, I'm with you. I love you. We see this dynamic as well back in Exodus chapter 4. In Exodus chapter 4, God is talking to Pharaoh. This is when the People are still enslaved in Egypt. Pharaoh was king of Egypt. God is speaking to him and says, Israel is my son, my firstborn. Let my son go so that he might serve me. Do you see that? The relationship here? There's sonship before service. Relationship before rules. Grace comes before works. God did not design the Ten Commandments to be a source of life. He did not design the Ten Commandments to be a path of salvation. We don't get right with God by what we do. The Ten Commandments are not a path of salvation. Really, 
one of the functions of the Ten Commandments is to be a mirror. It's not to be a source of life, but actually it's supposed to be a source of death. It's supposed to kill us. It's supposed to show us our flaws and our sins. That's what the function of the Ten Commandments was. This is what Paul reflects on in Galatians. He says in Galatians chapter 3, verse 19, why was the law given then? It was given because of transgressions to show our sin. For if the law had been given, which was able to impart life, then righteousness would indeed have been based on the law, but the Scriptures has shut up everyone under sin so that the promise by faith in Jesus Christ might be given to those who believe. Salvation is always, always by grace through faith. Abraham believed God and it was credited to him as righteousness. Before Abraham did anything, before Abraham was circumcised, before Abraham offered Isaac as a sacrifice, or almost as a sacrifice, he didn't actually kill his son. Before he did anything, he believed God and he was saved. Salvation is always by grace through faith. It's never based on our works or our moral performance. The people of Israel were not saved by the sacrificial system and killing an animal. They were not saved by their obedience to the law. They could only be saved by trusting in God and his promise of a, of a savior. That's how we're saved. It's Jesus alone. But so often in church, we, we, we like Jesus plus something. Because we're hardwired to think like, I need to make things right in my life. I need to do something, and if I don't do something, I don't have value or I can't contribute. And God says, no, none of that. You cannot do anything. And that's a slam on our pride. Because we think like, God, if I can just make things right for myself, I'll be good. And God says, you can't. The problem is too deep. Your sin runs too deep. It's too heinous. I will deal with it. And he sent his own son to die on the cross for our sins. You cannot be saved or have a relationship with God through your works, through being good. You can't because there is none righteous, no, not one. All have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. None of us will be ever good enough for God. And the law is intending to show us how bad we are. <laughs> so we, we, um, we kind of take things the exact opposite, right? God is saying, this is to show you how bad you are and to kill you. And we're like, we're going to get life through this. Yay. That's why I do find it a bit ironic because the people of Israel, they couldn't uphold these things. Then they were cast away into exile. I do find it a bit ironic that we want the Ten Commandments on our courthouses. Like, do we know what they did to Israel? <laughs> It killed them. It exiled them. It was meant to show us our need for a Savior. You cannot be saved through the law. You can only be saved through Jesus. I hope I'm being clear enough. So that's the first myth, is that it's a path of salvation. No, it's not. It is not. It was never intended to be that way. God's grace came to Israel, not because they were so good, but because he was. And it started with the relationship that God initiated. He chose them. He saved them. He rescued them. Rule, uh, relationship came before rules. The second myth. This is one that, if, if the first myth that we can be saved through the law, I think that generally originates in the church. I think this other myth um, originates outside the church, which is that the Ten Commandments, or I guess I'm kind of using it as a stand-in for the Bible more generally. The Ten Commandments are backwards, bigoted, and an oppressive moral code that's irrelevant for today. Is that a long enough point for you in my outline? I couldn't put it any more eloquently, I think. Or like, simply is what I meant, not eloquently. But a lot of people, they look at the Bible and they're like, man, it's 2023 now. This is the 21st century still, right? Okay, it's the 21st century. We left behind this stuff like, 
years ago. The Bible's irrelevant, and when you actually read it, it seems kind of backwards and oppressive, uh, and it's been used to oppress women, to support slavery, sexual uh, minorities, or people who uh, fall outside of practices of, of marriage of one man and one woman. Uh, it's used to discriminate against people like that. The Bible, it's just oppressive. And, and I think that um, when, we, when we read this, my question is, what is oppressive in this text? Right? What, what is it? Is it not murdering people? Is it not committing adultery and staying faithful? Like, is that really that oppressive? What about not killing or committing adultery, stealing, bearing false witness, coveting? Honoring our parents, right? I don't think that these things, if you actually look at them, that they're oppressive at all. I think a lot of that comes from a misunderstanding of, of Scripture and maybe just not, not reading the Bible super closely. I think what happens, though, really, I think the two biggest issues when people say uh, the Bible is backwards, irrelevant, and oppressive, to me it seems, uh, from my impression, it comes down to two issues. Uh, in our country, the fact that some Christians supported slavery and used, tried to use the Bible to justify that, and the Bible's sexual morality, and the fact that it condemns homosexuality and any other kind of sexual behavior outside of a marriage between a man and a woman. And so these are obviously big issues that if you want to get out of here before lunch, I won't be able to give an exhaustive treatment for, but let me just say two things about that, just to put two seeds in your mind. Number one, slavery. There was no slavery in the Garden of Eden, and there will be no slavery in heaven, in the new creation. Creation to new creation, that was not God's design or intent. And so what we see is that there were evil, sinful people. Yes, when sin entered the world, they did enslave others. They did oppress and exploit others, and sometimes so-called Christians try to use the Bible and twist the Bible to support their evil agenda. But if we actually read the Bible correctly, which is with Jesus at the center, and the Bible's big story framing our thinking, we read from Genesis to Revelation, and simply, there was no slavery in the garden. All people are made in God's image. They have inherent dignity, value, and worth. Let's live out our creational identity now. And in the new creation, it said that there will be people from every tribe, nation, and tongue worshiping around the throne. There is no slavery or oppression in the new creation. Let's live out our new creational identity now as well. The Bible never ever, ever supports slavery. Yes, there's some hard texts, and we can talk about that. I'll gladly, like if you have questions, would love to chat about that, so hit me up, but I just can't get into it now. Um, the other one is sex matters of sexuality, and um, the fact that the Bible, again, says the only appropriate context for sexual intimacy is between a man and a woman united in marriage. Everything else is wrong. And people see that as oppressive and, and bigoted at times. Um, again, I guess what I would say here is Jesus never had sex. Jesus never got married. So to me, that signals, because Jesus is, he was the most human human who ever lived, because he was without sin. So to me, that would signal that these matters are not of ultimate importance. That you can have a full, flourishing human life without these things in your life, because we look to Jesus. And ultimately, these matters of how we behave in our relationships and in this area of our lives, is really, it's to be normed by Christ. And really, the issue isn't so much of what is right or wrong, per se, that is important, but I think the more fundamental question is, who is Jesus? Who is Jesus to you? Is he who he claimed to be? Because if he is, then I think we will be willing to follow him wherever he leads. Wherever and make whatever sacrifices that he calls us to. 
And in fact, what I, what I see when we look at the Ten Commandments, right, I, I, I think that God's law, while it shows us our flaws, rightly interpreted, it actually also shows us the good life, gives us a picture of that. Because a society, right, or a group of people that don't kill each other, that they, they stay faithful to their marriage vows, they don't lie to each other, they don't steal from each other, and they honor relationships, particularly their parents, right, that society, that organization, or that group of people, it's going to flourish. Doesn't that sound great to be part of something where we don't lie to each other? Where we're not envious of what each other have and then have that that drive our desires, where we could cooperate together for a mission with no ego, where we could honor one another, where we would put away hate that can boil over from anger that resides in our hearts. I think that this gives us a truly amazing picture of what life in Christ can look like. So the second myth uh, is that these things are backwards, oppressive, irrelevant for today. I think they're, they're quite relevant, and I think you'll see that as we go through them more in depth. Um, but the third myth, the third myth of the text is that The third myth is that uh, these things are irrelevant for us as Christians. Now, you might be thinking, you know, Chris, you just kind of dogged on the law your whole first point. You said they're not a path of salvation, right? Therefore, why would they ever be relevant for us? We could just discard it and move on. Well, I want you to think about it this way. So, I don't know, uh, if I have time and I don't have kids crawling under my feet, I like to cook. And I don't know if you've ever made one of these recipes before, but you start it in one pan on the stovetop, and then you take the pan and you put it in the oven if the pan is oven rated, right? It all keeps it in one thing, and you put it in the oven, and then you take it out of the oven and put it on the the stovetop again to rest at the end. And that's what I did one time. And so I put the stovetop, put the pan on the stovetop as I took it out of the oven. And then I started working on other ingredients. And I started preparing those. But in my infinite wisdom, I had forgotten I had just taken this pan out of the oven. And so for whatever reason, I needed to make room on my stovetop, and I went to move the pan, and so I reached out, and I grabbed the handle without the oven mitt on. I'd learned my lesson that day. I burned my hand just by reaching out and grasping that. And I think that is a way of thinking about how we approach God's law, that if we try to reach out and grab these things in our own humanness, in our flesh, with our own abilities, you will get burned. And so in order to handle them properly, what do you need? You need your mitts, right? You put your mitts on, then you can handle the pan properly. You can move it around and do with it what you will. And with the commands of God, we need to be clothed with Christ's righteousness. We need to be covered with the blood of Jesus. We need to be forgiven and have relationship with God, but if we're clothed in Christ, we can reach out and we can handle the commands of God properly so that they're not a source of death any longer, but they're a vision of the good life. We need our proverbial mitts on in order to handle these things. And so when we hear the Ten Commandments, a default mindset could be, well, how do I keep these things? What do I need to do? But I think that's entirely the wrong question. When we read the Ten Commandments, the question that you should ask yourself is this. How do they show me Jesus? In Romans chapter 10, verse 4, the Apostle Paul says, Christ is the end of the law or the destination of the law for all who believe. He's the goal. He's what these commandments are actually all about. The Ten Commandments are irrelevant for us as Christians if Jesus becomes irrelevant for us. 
But I, I would say Jesus is relevant, right, for us, and therefore in him these things become relevant because he is the one who first and foremost fulfilled these things on your behalf. The first two commandments in verses 2 and 4 through 6 are about really worshiping the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength. And that's what Jesus came to do. He says, I have come not to do my will, but the will of him who sent me. Jesus was the perfect human being, completely submissive to the will of the Father. Worship the Father even right before he was crucified where he says, not my will be done, but yours. Jesus Love the Lord his God with all of his heart, soul, mind, and strength. The third commandment is to bear or carry the name of the Lord into the world. And Jesus was, bore God's name as he had the mission of God. And he set his face like flint to go to Jerusalem to die on the cross for our sins. He bore God's name in perfect submission to his will. The fourth commandment is to remember the Sabbath day. And keep it holy. And we see that Christ came as Lord over the Sabbath. That he offers true rest in us. The Sabbath commandment really isn't about physical rest, although that's part of it. But it's really about resting from our works. Finding life and restoration in Jesus. The commandment to honor your father and mother, Jesus fulfilled by honoring his heavenly father in all things. And now he has a land which will exist forever in the new creation. Jesus never murdered, but in fact he was murdered. The innocent lamb of God who was slain on the cross. Jesus never committed adultery, but he was the faithful bridegroom who was pursuing his bride, the church, the people of God. Jesus never stole, but in fact, he was the generous one who came from heaven, and although he was rich in heavenly glory, he became poor for us. And he never bore false witness, but he was the true prophet of the Lord, and while others slandered him, bore witness, false witness about him, he never reviled in return, he never insulted in return, but he spoke the truth, and he did not covet. When the devil came to Jesus and says, I will offer you all the kingdoms of the world, everything that you could ever want. Jesus says, no. I've come to do the will of the Father. The Ten Commandments are relevant for us because Jesus is relevant. These things aren't first and foremost about our rule keeping or our commandment keeping these things are about how do they show us Christ and now that we are in Christ we can obey these things through the power of the Holy Spirit not perfectly of course but that's why Jesus came to die for our forgiveness and so these give us a vision of the good life or we are worshiping the one true God and not falling prey to idols. It gives us a vision of resting in Christ from all of our works where we can have deep satisfaction in Him. It gives us a vision where we properly honor the key relationships in our life where we are not exploiting or murdering or lying to or envious of one another. Doesn't that sound good to you? This is the life that Jesus is inviting us into. But first, you must come to him. And that's what communion is all about this morning. It's about coming to Christ. Jesus has given us two sacred symbols, baptism and communion, or the Lord's Supper, to communicate the deep truth of how much he loves us and how much our salvation cost. When we come to communion, it is a true communion, communing with Christ. Too often, I think many times in churches in our theological tradition, we, we kind of downgrade uh, communion because sometimes it doesn't always elicit an emotional reaction. We're merely taking some bread and some wine. But it is a call to faith. When we come in faith to the table, we are actually and truly communing with Jesus. His presence is here, or rather we are lifted up to his presence. 
when we celebrate these things by faith, as our statement of faith says as a church, when we celebrate these things in faith, they nourish and strengthen us as believers. Communion is about relationship. And so that's what we're coming to celebrate this morning, this relationship that we have with Christ in the communion elements. So if you are serving this morning, if you could please come forward. Our practice as a church is to come up and receive uh, the elements after we pray. You will come down, uh, if you leave the left side of your pew, come down, uh, receive your elements, make your way back to your seat, and then when everyone is served, we will all partake together because this is a family meal. This is a meal for the people of God who have come to trust uh, in Christ. And because it is that family meal, if you have not embraced Jesus as your Savior, if you have not found life in Jesus yet, we would just ask you to please refrain from coming forward and taking communion. The Bible teaches against that, and uh, communion is a, is a family meal. But this is an opportunity maybe for you, if, if you have never accepted the sacrifice of Jesus for your forgiveness, that uh, this is an opportunity for you to take Christ. Take Christ as people are, are passing by, coming down, uh, an opportunity to reflect and to uh, maybe embrace Christ for the first time. Uh, you can do that with a, simple, with a simple prayer of admitting that you have sinned against him, um, but that you are confessing your sin and you are believing and trusting in, in Jesus. And if that's a prayer, maybe that you pray this morning uh, while we're partaking in communion, please let us know. I'd love to, to talk with you more about it um, and celebrate that, that decision that you made and then prepare you to take communion with us as a family uh, uh, next time. But as you come forward, believer, this is an encouraging time for you. Yes, we should examine our life, and the Bible calls for self-examination in communion. But it is not to be a morbid introspection where you just feel bad about yourself, but it's an opportunity to see where you haven't measured up, but flee and fly to Jesus. Because that's what the commandments of the Lord are about. They are about Christ. They do indeed show us our flaws, but they do indeed show a deeper reality that there was one who was never flawed, one who never sinned, one who always kept the commandments perfectly, and he offers his perfect righteousness to us by faith. And so if you are in Christ this morning, this time of reflection, yes, examine your life, but it is also meant to be an encouragement. It is meant to be a time where you find solace, and pardon in Jesus alone. So we will uh, prepare here, and then I'll pray, and then we will um, partake in these elements together. Right, let's pray. Lord, we thank you for your abundant goodness to us, for your kindness and faithfulness, and that you have supplied everything we need in Christ. Lord, as we reflect, we will admit that we have fallen short of your glory this week. And yet, Lord, we thank you for Christ's provision, for his pardon. As we partake in these elements, remind us of the truth that we are in Christ. In his name we pray, amen. Christ's body broken for you. 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 Christ's body broken for you.
The Apostle Paul writes about communion, the Lord's Supper, in 1 Corinthians 11. He says, For I received from the Lord that which I also delivered to you, that the Lord Jesus, in the night in which he was betrayed, took bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, This is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way, he took the cup also after supper, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. For as often as you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. Heavenly Father, you have worked a miracle here today that as we come before you under your word and gathering as the people of God together to sing and to encourage each other, you are here present amongst us. Where two or three gathered in your name, you are there. Lord, I pray that you would strengthen us, that you would equip us, that you would encourage us for the week ahead. Lord, we recognize that we need strength, but it cannot come from within us, from ourselves but it can only come from you and your spirit. In Jesus' name, amen. Would you please stand and sing with us?
As we prepare to receive the blessing, remember that we go in the grace of God. Jesus is our life, and we live under the banner of it is finished. And so here's this word of blessing for the road this week. Peace be to you, and love and faith from God the Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. Grace be with all who love our Lord Jesus Christ with a love incorruptible. You are sent. Thank you.